Glory to the name of Jesus. Give him praises in this place. Hallelujah. Thank you for coming to church. Thank you for joining with the technology we've got over here. Praise the name of Jesus. All good and all the same. Church, we're going to have a great time in the presence of the Lord. Please bring your faith and bring your expectations to the table so we can have a good time in the presence of the Lord because every joint is going to supply. Hallelujah. Welcome to church. This is Church of Hero Smart. Hallelujah. Hero Smart is a ministry set up by God for the discipleship of the nations. Keeping with the instruction of Jesus in Matthew chapter 28, which says, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you to do. And though I will be with you till the end of the age. And in trying to keep this instruction in this ministry, God's given us the privilege to create a resource through which we can do that very well. And that resource we've titled the Online Discipleship Program, or the ODP. The ODP is a set of studies from the Word of God, which may be sectioned into five major categories. The pharmacy section of the Word, the milk section of the Word, the meat section of the Word, the water section of the Word, and combination meals. And God being gracious with us, we've come through the pharmacy aspect of it in 2021. Glory to God. We'll wrap that up last week. And we're going to get started with another section of the ODP today that will be the milk aspect of the Word of God. Hallelujah. The milk section of the Word of God is going to be another part of the ODP that we're going to get started today. And we're going to go for it. Um, how do we know that there are going to be additional sections of the Word of God that we can call the milk of the Word? It's based on scriptures like Hebrews chapters 5 and 6, 1 Peter chapter 2, um, certain concepts that Jesus talked about when he said that I've made everything known to you. But then later on in another portion of the Gospels, Yahushua is going to tell them, well, I've got a lot of things to talk about, but I just can't tell you guys right now because you can't bear it. But I thought you said you made everything known to them. Well, he made everything known to them at a milk level. But then there are going to be additional details that he couldn't get into. Those we are going to call the meat of the word in subsequent chapters. Hallelujah. Subsequent sections of the ODP. So let's go ahead and turn to Hebrews chapter 5. And in verse 11, we are going to get started with the milk section of the ODP today. Really fun study of the word of God. Glory to God. The Word of God says in Hebrews chapter 5 and in verse 11, it says, We have much to say about this, but it is hard to explain. Well, this, what is this over there? Well, if you back up just a few verses, you're going to see it's talking about the priestly aspect of Jesus as a high priest and your priestly aspect under him so he can serve and function in the heavenly tabernacle. That's going to be the meat of the Word. But he says, We have a lot of things to talk about this, but it's really hard to explain because you're slow to learn. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. So that's how we know that there are going to be certain teachings of the word that we can call elementary teachings of Christianity. And those are going to be the milk of the word, not solid food. It says, anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. Oh, so it means that being exposed to the milk of the word is going to get me to be acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But what does that mean? But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish between good and evil. All right. So being acquainted with, teach, with the teaching of my righteousness over here is going to be equivalent to being able to distinguish between good and evil. Not necessarily being able to repent. You've got to get into repentance quickly, as quickly as possible. You can get in repentance in the pharmacy section of the word, the milk section of the word. Anytime God convict, con, con, uh, convicts your heart about something, quickly repent of it. But to be able to sustain that status of no treason in your heart right now, especially at the baby level, you got to understand certain concepts of the word that we are going to call the milk of the word. So what are these concepts? Well, that's what Hebrews chapter 6 now talks about. It says, therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings of our Christ and go on to maturity, 
not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that leads to death, and our faith in God, instruction about baptisms, the laying out of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And God permitting, we will do so. So the Word of God gives us a catalog of certain concepts in Christianity that we can call the Milko Word. Repentance from dead works, faith toward God, instructions about baptisms, the laying of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. Those concepts, six of them, by the grace of God, God allow the writer of the book of Hebrews to document down for us. And those concepts are going to be the milk of the word, and they are going to provide a platform for additional, additional concepts of Christianity later on. And when we get to the midsection of the Word of God, you are going to see that actually these concepts are foundational because they are going to provide the basis for additional studies of the priestly ministry as we are going to see the tabernacle of Moses. You're going to see that repentance from dead works is going to be the basis for your undergarment of righteousness. When we get over there in the priest's study of the Word of God. The doctrine of faith is going to be your, the, the foundation to your tunic of righteousness, for example. In the, in the priestly section, the meat of the word, you're going to see the doctrine of baptisms will be your foundation to the robe of righteousness, the ephod of righteousness. And all these concepts of the milk of the word, they are going to provide basis. They are going to provide the platform for additional operations, additional studies of the word of God when we get to the meat section of the word. So that's why a lot of times you are going to see, hear people talking about, well, the milk of the word are going to be the foundation of the believer. And I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say the milk of the word will be the foundation of the meat of the word. But the foundation of the believer is obedience to the truth of the God kind of love. Obedience is your foundation as a temple of the Lord. But the milk of the word will just be information that you need to sustain that status of obedience for you. Why is that delineation important? Well, the reason that delineation is important is because if you think that the milk of the word is going to be your foundation, then the devil can hijack that incomplete understanding to tell you, well, your milk studies are not complete right now, so that's fine. Your foundation uh, doesn't necessarily have to be completed because your, your milk of the word is not complete. And he can't allow treasons to be in your heart because of that. <laughs> so we closed that loop, I believe, about two or three years ago to say that the foundation of the believer is going to be the is going to be obedience to the word, but foundation of the meat of the word will be the milk of the word. Pretty much like you're growing up um, as a mathematical student, as a mathematics student. Um, you are going to start an element, elementary algebra. They are going to teach you that 2 plus 2 is equal to 4. 2 plus 2 plus 2 is equal to 6. Well, that little understanding over there is going to be the basis for advanced study of mathematics when you get to college. And you start talking about calculus. You start talking about dy, dx. You start talking about integral calculus, the differential calculus. Well, there is no differential calculus if there is no elementary algebra. It's not possible. You just can't put the two together. You can't understand how to differentiate properly if you don't understand the basics of addition and subtraction. Well, guess what? The same thing with the Word of God. There is no understanding how to function like a priest of the heavenly tabernacle if you do not understand the basics that we call the milk of the Word. The basics of repentance from dead works. Faith toward God, instruction about baptisms, the laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, all those advanced studies that we are going to get into in the meat of the word. And I believe you, you better believe me, they are advanced studies of Christianity. If you're just joining the ODP or stumbling in our messages for the very first time, I want to implore you, please go step by step. So don't you think that, well, I can see something over there on YouTube that talks about, well, the faith of a priest. I'm just going to delve deeper into it. You may choke on it. I don't want you to choke on these concepts of the Word of God. They are technical things that really, really leverage the platform of what we are going to start today as the milk of the Word. So it's important. So we're going to start, start with those bases, um, those, those basics. In the name of Jesus, please make sure you follow the curriculum, so to say. Pharmacy first, we're going to fix your attitude. I have attitudes to be fixed right now. Let's get over to the milk of the word to build my understanding a little bit. 
And then we're going to get to the meat of the word subsequently by the grace of God. All right. So the, these uh, can, so studies can be found in Hebrews chapter 6 from verse 1 to verse 3 over there. Repentance from dead works. Faith toward God, instruction about baptisms, the laying of hands, resurrection, and eternal judgment. And another per passage of scripture in 1 Peter chapter 2, I'm going to ask you please turn over there, gives us further clue into why the milk of the word is going to be necessary. Now, Hebrews chapter 6 lets us understand the what of it, a little bit of the how of it, the how and the why of it. The why of it is so we can distinguish between good and evil. Um, 1 Peter chapter 2 provides further clarity. I'm going to ask you please turn over there. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. Therefore, read yourselves of all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy, envy and slander of every kind. Get into perfect obedience right now. <laughs> That's what that verse of scripture is saying. And subsequently, like newborn babies... Crave or desire pure spiritual milk. Why? So you can grow up. So get into perfect obedience. Get exposed to the sincere milk of the word so you can grow up right now. Bless the name of Jesus. In your salvation, now that you've tasted that the Lord is good. So the milk of the word, when I desire the milk of the word, I get an opportunity to grow up in my salvation. Well, what's the meaning of growing up in my salvation? Growing up in your salvation is going to be indicative of exactly what happened to Yahushua. In Luke chapter 2, I'm going to ask you to turn there. Luke chapter 2, you're going to see how Yahushua grew up in wisdom and stature. Growing up in wisdom and stature is not going to be equivalent to, well, I'm going to be, become more perfect in my obedience right now. I'm going to, maybe I'm going to tolerate a little bit of treason. When I was a baby, I told you that that's not, that's not acceptable. you got to get out of treason right now. A baby's going to be out of treason. A young man is going to be out of treason. Whatever level of spiritual development you may be in there, God's not going to put on you beyond what you are able to bear. So I get rid of treason regardless but the fact that I get rid of treason does not mean I have the wisdom of a child. Does not mean I have the wisdom of a young man. Does not mean I have the wisdom of a father right now. You got to grow in wisdom. That's where spiritual growth com comes to play. I gave the example numerous times. that You may have a baby growing up in a household. And the baby doesn't necessarily have to go to jail before she or he learns how to behave themselves as proper and a, a good citizens of the community. Um, and so long as the baby is eating right and, and he or she is listening to the orders of the parents, she's going to be perfectly normal. She's going to be perfectly obedient. She's not going to be in any kind of treason. She's not going to be in any kind of trouble with the government. She's not going to be, no, she's not going to be all of that. But just the fact that the baby is not in trouble and she's growing up or he is growing up does not necessarily mean that he or she has the wisdom to pull up to the street right and start driving around a car. No, she's got to develop that wisdom. She got, she's got to understand the concept of direction. She's got to understand to grow that muscle to be able to pull that car and to turn that steering and all that. Well, she's still growing up. She's still growing up. But that does not mean that there is treason in her heart. Even though she doesn't have the wisdom to drive the car to the grocery store just yet. Compare this natural parallels to understand the purpose of the milk of the word. The purpose of the milk of the word is not to help you to get rid of treason. It is to help you to sustain the status of no treason. Sustain the status of no treason as you journey on and your judgment escalates. In the things of the Spirit, judgment for your glory, not for your demise, so to say. So look at how Jesus grew up over here in Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2 and verse 51 says, Then he went to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Yahushua grew up in wisdom and stature and found favor with God and man. It is a Yahushua grew up in becoming more compliant and uh, with less treason in his heart. No, that's already settled. No treason. 
but he had grown wisdom. Oh, so there are some things that Yahushua knew when he was at the age of 18 that he didn't know at the age of 12. Correct. Why? Because he's grown in wisdom. There are certain things that Yahushua knew when he was 30 that he didn't know when he was 18. Correct. Why? Because he's grown in wisdom. There are certain things that Yahushua knew when he was 33 that he didn't know when he was 30. Correct. Because he's grown in wisdom. And for your information, there are certain things that Yahushua knows right now in 2021 that he didn't know 2,000 years ago when he was here during his earthly ministry. Why? Because he hasn't stopped growing wisdom either. Whoa! What are you talking about? Correct. Go look out the book of Revelation. The details of the book of Revelation that Jesus sent over to the beloved brother John were, were more complete than the overview that he told the disciples in Matthew 24 on the Mount of Olives. Well, if Jesus knew the book of Revelation, uh, <laughs> when he was talking to those guys, the disciples on the Mount of Olives, why didn't he talk about it? Because they asked him the same question. Matthew 24 was just a replay of the book of Revelation, the condensed version. But Jesus didn't know that much. But he got up to heaven to spend a few years with the Father, and the Father started downloading certain nuggets of how the age is going to close into his heart. So when the age is going to close, there's going to be Sue 1 over here, Sue 2 over there, Sue 3 over there. Oh, yeah. Go ahead and send it to your boys. They found John the Beloved out of Patmos and sent it over to you. Why? It was growing in wisdom. If Yahushua grew in wisdom, based on Luke, 2, Luke chapter 2, verse 52 over here, if he grew in wisdom when he started his ministry at the age of 30, if he hasn't stopped growing in wisdom, even right now in 2021, why should you stop growing in wisdom? Think about that. Why should I stop growing in wisdom? Yahushua, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, will you call Jesus or Yeshua in your, in your language? He has not stopped growing in wisdom. Why should you stop? <laughs> well, I don't know about you. That's going to motivate me to want to study the milk of the word and study it all over again and study the meat of the word. And everything I need to come across to study, I am going to study it by the grace of God. So you got to understand based on this fact that you are like a newborn baby, especially if you're still coming into these things freshly. Um, it doesn't matter if you've been, been an adult, you've been a Christian for the past 35 years. If you do not have enough wisdom to sustain the status of perfect obedience, you're still a baby. You don't have a wisdom to distinguish between good and evil. You don't have a wish stop when things are getting murky in your, in your eyes. You, you do not understand God's character. You say, oh, what's going on in here? I'm not really certain. Well, there are certain, certain gaps over there. you got to go close and go back and learn a few wisdom strategies from the milk of the word. Get on board with it by the grace of God. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 now says, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by man, but, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priest, to offer in spiritual sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ. So verse 4 downwards now tells us that, well, the reason God is going to be expecting you guys to get, to get built up with the milk of the word is because ultimately God wants you to be built up into a spiritual house so that you can start a function as a priest of the heavenly tabernacle. Well, that concept is further reiterated in Mark chapter 11 when Jesus was talking about the temple of the Old Testament. Let's look at Mark 11, Mark 11 chapter 7. You've got to understand that there are physical symbolisms that God wants us to realize to compare to natural or spiritual realities. In Mark chapter 11 and verse 7, when they brought the, the coals to Jesus and, th uh, uh, and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. And many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches they had caught in the fields. And those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest. 
Yahushua entered, the, entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. He looked around at everything, but since he was already late, he went back and out to Bethany with the twelve disciples. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry, seeing in, in a distance a fig tree in a leaf. He went out to find a fruit on it. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs just yet. Then he said to the tree, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who were buying and selling over there. He overturned the tables of the money changers, the benches of those selling doves, and would not allow anyone to carry mer merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written? My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. But you've made it a den of robbers. So God expected the physical temple back in the Old Testament to be a house of prayer, to be a house of glory. But guess what? In the New Testament right now, that's what your life is meant to be. Your life, my life individually and collectively we shall be temples of the living God houses of prayer places of glory which scripture says that well turn to second Corinthians chapter 6 you're going to see why this is important right now to start appreciating the milk of the word because the milk of the word is going to get you built up just like Peter was talking about into the spiritual house into the spiritual house the milk of the word is going to get you built up like that now let's look at it. Built up in what? Built up in wisdom. It's going to help you build up in wisdom and build you, build you up in stature, spiritual stature, so you can carry that glory, okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 16. It says, What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will live with them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. So God says that you are a temple of the living God. A temple. Not a place where merchandise is going to be sold, but you literally are a temple of the living God. You're going to see in another portion of the scripture, it says your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Well, your spirit is going to be a temple of the Lord. Your body is going to be a temple of your life altogether will be a temple of the Lord. But you got to realize that just like physical temples back in the Old Testament has different parts, had different parts to it. There is the foundation of that temple. There is the structure of that temple. There is the walls. There are dimensions that God put together in the tabernacle of Moses, which they replicated into a physical temple during the time of Solomon, uh, the king of Judah, back in those days, king of Israel, back in those days. Well, in the same way, those things have been migrated over right now into the realm of the spirit, because God says that a time is going to come when true worshipers will worship God in spirit and in truth. So God right now is not really interested in the physical buildings anymore. That's the reason during the crucifixion of Jesus, the curtain of the temple was, was torn in the two to let people know that I'm, I'm not really interested in physical buildings anymore. I want to indwell people right now. And that's what Yahushua was trying to get across to the woman of the well in John chapter 4. Let's take a look at that. John chapter 4, Jesus talking to the woman out of the well, told that woman that the time is going to come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The woman, believe me. Let's see what Jesus is talking about over here. John chapter 4 and verse 19. It says, Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Yahushua declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when we, you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know, but we worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, 
and his worshippers must worship him in spirit and in truth. Jesus is letting this woman know over there that there's going to be a time when the physical temple will be done and over with. Well, guess what? The physical temple being done and over with doesn't mean that God is not going to be interested in some kind of worship. He's going to be interested when everything right now is going to be translated into the realm of the Spirit. That's the reason your body can be a temple of the Holy Spirit. Even though you're not a physical building anymore, the way you pattern your life, after the structure of the physical building can be a temple, a carrier of God's glory. And just like physical temples are going to have the soils to them, they're going to have the foundation to them, they're going to have the structure to them. If you understand certain things that we are going to be talking about in the ODP, you can literally fix your life as a temple of the Holy Spirit, carriers of the glories of God. Carriers of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit and everything and every, and every, everywhere you go. You can literally be a carrier of the glory of God. Why? Because you are a temple of the Lord, temple of the living God. And that's the reason we came up with this graphic by the grace of God several years ago. You're wondering why are we classifying the ODP into all these different parts of these different components of food categories. Well, the reason for it is because of scriptures by 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 16, John chapter 4, 1 Peter chapter 2, Mark chapter 11 from verse 17 downwards that I just read to you a few moments ago. The believer is going to be like a temple of the living God. You are like a building. Even though there are no physical buildings anymore, you got to understand that your operation in the things of the Spirit can be likened to a building altogether. You are this building over there. But a building is going to have a foundation to it. A building is going to have a soil on which that foundation after the seeds. And on top of that foundation, there is going to be the structure over there. There's going to be the roof and the beams and all of these things that make a building in preparation for the entrance of the glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord wants to be part of that building. Why is that glory important? What is that glory? The glory of the Lord will be supernatural actions of God that God wants to use to promote the influence of righteousness and peace and joy all over the earth. Pretty much like what he did in the tabernacle of Moses. There was really nothing big about the tabernacle. I mean, there's really no big deal over there if the glory of the Lord has departed from the tabernacle. But what made the tabernacle really big, what made a big deal out of the tabernacle was because the glory of the Lord was present over there. That's the reason any time the glory is going to lift, they're going to unpack the tabernacle and move it somewhere else where the glory of the Lord is going to be settled on it. Well, if the glory of the Lord is not on your life as a person, then you're just worthless. Because <laughs> you're that temple right now. My body is that temple. It should be a carrier of those glories. Carrier of carrier the glory of God. What am I talking about? Carrier of divine operations of the spirit of the Lord. What we call dilemmas through parties in this ministry, carriers of the Holy Spirit's operation on the earth. Why? To advance the purpose of righteousness, peace and joy on the earth through word of wisdom, word of knowledge, discernment of spirits, gift of faith, gift of healings, prophecy, diverse counter tongues, interpretation, all those things to enforce the character of God in divine love and motion, which we are going to be delving deeper into. When we get in the faith toward God for divine love, you should have a structure, the way you operate, every morning, every evening, your wisdom strategies, all of those are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And the Word of God lets us know that the temple of the Holy Spirit, which you are by the grace of God, is going to have a foundation. Now, which scripture talks about that? The foundation of the believer. The foundation of the believer as the temple of the Lord can be seen in Luke chapter 6. Let's turn over there. That's going to be another scripture that you are going to um, know that, uh, well, there's going to be some kind of spiritual building that I am a part of and that I am individually by the grace of God. Look at Luke chapter 6 over here. This is Jesus talking to the disciples from verse 46. Yahushua says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? I will show you what he is like who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice or obey what I, what I say. He is like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on a rock. 
When a flock came, the tarn struck against that house, could eat, but he could not shake it, because it was well built. But the one who hears my word and does not put into practice is, is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the tarn struck that house, it collapsed, and its destruction was complete. So can, you, so can you see what Jesus is talking about over there? So Yahushua is saying that if you hear the words that I'm talking about, you're hearing the words of uh, the meal call word. You're hearing the pharmacy section of the word. You're hearing the meat of the word. When you hear the word and you do the word, you are like somebody who's building a house. Can you see that? Luke chapter 6 from verse 4 to 6. So hearing the word and obey. Lots of you have been faithfully obeying all the instructions we've been talking about. We talked about the instruction of the pharmacy section of the word for the past five, five or so weeks or six weeks. Talking about how to fix your attitudes from HHF level one to level seven. You guys are doing something about that. Well, you are the one building a house right now. What part of your building is being fixed when you obey the instruction of the pharmacy part of the word? Guess what? Your soil. When you obey the instruction of HO and HU3 and you eliminate a worry from your heart, guess what? You're getting your soil real good over there. Hearing the word, simply hearing the word is not going to fix your soil for you. But hearing and obeying instruction of the word is going to fix that soil for you. Get you ready for that temple to sit on that soil. Hear it, obey. You're doing something. You're building a house. You're building a house. You're building a house. Now we're going to be getting to the meal called the word. Your soil is fixed right now with HHF and Christian levels. There's grace and there's mercy over there. You heard something. You obeyed it. Guess what? You got your soil right now. That's what we call the pharmacy section of the word. You got your soil ready. Then we're going to be getting to the meal called the word right now, which the meal called the word is going to be the foundation of that building, which is going to be equivalent to the foundation of understanding how to distinguish between good and evil. Well, guess what? You're going to hear certain things about repentance from dead works, faith to where God is trusted about baptisms, laying of hands, a resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. You're hearing those things and you're doing something about it. Hearing, doing, hearing, obeying, hearing, doing. Guess what? You're building something. You're building the foundation for that temple right now with obedience to the Word of God. And then when we're going to get to the meat of the Word of God, we're going to hear things about the concept of being a priest of the heavenly tabernacle. How you need to put on your undergarment of righteousness, your tunic of righteousness, your robe of righteousness. Guess what? You're building the structure of that temple. You're building the roof on it. You're putting the beams on it. You're putting the windows over there. You're putting something on it. Ultimately, for you to have a complete structure, then God is going to check it. He's going to say, well, he's got his soul right. Well, the soil is right over there. The foundation is in place. The beams are in place. Well, the, the roof is over there. Come on, let's go in there with our glory. And that's exactly what happened in the tabernacle of Moses as well. When they built everything according to the pattern that God showed them on the mountain, he was inspected. Then the Lord entered with his glory. Now turn to Exodus chapter 4. And all these things are going to be applicable in our lives. If we complete all these studies of the ODP by the grace of God and we obey everything talked about, we are going to see the Father come in into our lives with a manifestation of His glory, which is what we're looking for. Exodus chapter 40, let's take a look at it. Glory, glory, glory to Jesus. Let's go for it. Hallelujah. Exodus chapter 40 in verse 33. Then Moses set up the courtyard around the tabernacle and the altar and put up the curtains of the entrance of the courtyard. And so Moses finished the work. Then the cloud covered the tent of the meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Can you see over there? You see, the glory of the Lord didn't fill the tabernacle prior to the time that the tabernacle was completed. Oh, wow. So the glory of the Lord is not going to fill that tabernacle until your temple is completed. And that's going to be accurate in the things of the Spirit. So what will happen to me then, prior to me completing all these studies of the ODP and stuff like that, it means there's not going to be any glory in my life, in quotes. Well, but if you stay inside somebody else's temple, 
Somebody else's operation was more complete than your operations. You, you get into their wisdom strategies over there. You get and you put it on their strength. You're going to be a partaker of their glories. And it's going to look like you got your temple completed already. Bless the name of Jesus. That's the beauty of submission. That's the beauty of the things we're talking about. But ultimately, God wants you as you're growing over there. That you have a name right now. You have an inheritance of things of the spirit. We're going to get into all the details of that. The implication of having a functional temple of the Lord that you can carry over is because you have a name and things of the spirit that God can use to enforce the counsel of righteousness on the earth. And all these things are really technical, spiritual technical details. I'm trying my best possible to break it down. These are natural analogies, but they are really, really technical. You got, you got to carry your mind along. We're going to start studying those kind of concepts today by the grace of God. The milk of the word will get your foundation ready. And again, remember, foundation is going to be equivalent to obedience to the truth of the word of God. Especially obedience to God's moral standards. Just like Old Testament physical temples, our lives and operations as glory carriers will include the soil, which will be obedience, which obedience to the pharmacy and water instructions, increasing HHF, attitudes of the good soil, talked about honesty, humility, and faith. In Mark chapter 4, Matthew chapter 13, Luke chapter 8, will fix this for us. Foundation, obedience to the milk of the word will fix this for us. The structure, obedience to the meat of the word, and the water section of the word, advanced truth of God kind of love, function as a priest of the heavenly tabernacle, will fix this for us. Simply hearing instructions will not fix any part of your building, rather obedience to instructions will fix all the aspects of your building for you as the temple of the Lord. The objective of the milk of the word is to give you the wisdom strategies that you require to sustain the status of perfect obedience and not allow the devil to fool you into good and evil. I get you confused about what good and evil is. Just like the book of Hebrews chapter 5 and chapter 6 talked about over there. So the elementary teachings of Christianity that we are going to get started talking about will include instructions that will help baby Christians to distinguish between good and evil so they can sustain a status of perfect obedience to the truth of the God kind of love. They form the basis of advanced studies of Christianity. And we are going to get started today with the very first part of it that we call repentance from dead works. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 6 talks about repentance from dead works, faith toward God, instruction about baptisms, we're going to get started today with the very first aspect of it, repentance from dead works. But I'm going to break that word into two parts, because he has two parts to it. He has repentance, and he has dead works. Hallelujah. Can you see those two parts over there? Hebrews chapter 6. You see over there in verse 1. There, therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from actions that lead to death. So there is repentance and there are dead works. What are dead works? Well, my version of the Bible, which is the NIV, spelt, spelt it out really clearly for me by saying actions that lead to death. Actions that lead to death will be actions of sins of commission. Let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 13. Well, put, put a bookmark over there. Let's turn to Romans chapter 6 verse 23 to, just to start with. Romans chapter, chapter 6 and verse 23. It says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So what is going to be a dead work over there? Dead work is going to be a sin. The sin which is going to be leading to death. In Jeremiah chapter 2 right now. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 2. We're going to be talking about repentance from dead works. After this overview that I've given you right now concerning why are we breaking all these things down into milk, water, blah. blah. It's because we're trying to fix the different parts of your building. We're trying to give you different wisdom strategies to fix the different parts of your building so that the glory of the Lord can zoom, zoom into your life. Supernatural actions can't zoom into your life. 
So you can't be able to distinguish between good and evil. I'm, I'm going to keep saying it over and over and over again. That's the reason we started the ODP by the grace of God. Jeremiah chapter 2 and in verse 30. Let's take a look at that. Praise the name of Jesus. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living waters, and I've dug their own cisterns and broken six cisterns that cannot hold water. Well, forsaken the Lord, God's going to call that sin, and that's going to be a dead work as well. And that is, well, the, 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 the book of Hebrews is telling us we've got to repent from. Repent from dead works, repent from actions that lead to dead works. Actions like forsaking the Lord, actions of treason. Actions that are going to be similar to what Adam and Eve committed in the Garden of Eden. A violation of a commandment. When God says, don't do this, you went ahead and you did it, that particular rebellion over there is going to kill you. And we're talking about death right now. We're not talking about a cessation of physical existence. Because that's not death from God's standpoint. Death from God's standpoint is a loss of right standing relationship with the Father of Light, which will constrict the flow of the nature of God, divine nature, into your heart. And once that happens, you lose the ability not to sin anymore, just like we talked about in the pharmacy section of the words. You get into this vortex of sin and death, and sin and death, and sin and death, all because of sins of commission. Why am I talking about sins of commission over there? Why? Well, because the Bible says in 1 John chapter 5 that there is another sin that is not going to lead to death. Now let's take a look at that. 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 6 and it says, If anyone sees his brother or sister or anybody, it doesn't matter, committing a sin that does not lead to death, he should pray and God will give him life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. But there is a sin that leads to death. I'm not saying that, that you should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is a sin that does not lead to death. So God allowed John to document for us right here two major categories of sins. All wrongdoing is going to be sin, but the Bible says over there that there's going to be one that's going to lead to death. There's going to be another one that's not going to lead to death. So that lets us know that there are two categories, two major categories. First, John chapter 5, from verse 16 to verse 17. Make sure you bookmark that. There is a sin that leads to death. There is a sin that does not lead to death. Well, what we need to repent from right now is the sin that's going to lead to death. But then it's important for us to appreciate and understand what is this other sin that's not going to lead to death. And we're going to talk about all those as well by the grace of God. So two major categories of sins. Sin that will lead to death. I'm going to call that the sin of commission or SOC. And there is the sin that does not lead to death. I'm going to call that the sins of omission, S-O-M. If you see the study notes on the board, you're going to see all those different categories. And I'm going, to, I'm going to break it down by the grace of God. Sins of commission, SOC, will lead to death, which is going to be a loss of right standing relationship with the Father. Sins of omission will not lead to death immediately, which will be sins, which will be SOM, just like you can see on the board. So under sins of commission that will lead to death, it is important to understand that there are still two major categories, or two subcategories under SOCs. There is, a, there, is a, there is an SOC that leads to legitimate guilt. There is an SOC that does not lead to legitimate guilt, but produces illegitimate guilt. What am I talking about? What is an SOC that's going to lead to legitimate guilt? Well, what I'm talking about is... If there is a violation of an explicit instruction of the word or a violation of an explicit instruction of God's moral standard revealed to one's conscience starting from the age of accountability, even without access to the logos or the written word. And you violate it because God is going to tell you what is right and wrong in your heart, right from the age of accountability. Oh, but I didn't have access to the Bible. It doesn't matter. God is speaking to your heart. Everybody around the planet knows it's, it's wrong to lie and to steal. Everybody around the planet just knows intuitively that's wrong. Who told you that that's wrong? 
You, you, need, you didn't have to read your Bible. You just know well, that's wrong. I'm saying, I shouldn't, I shouldn't tell a lie. I shouldn't cheat. I shouldn't. You knew that. Why? Because the commandments of the Lord are written in your conscience. How do we know that? Turn to Romans, in Romans chapter 1. The Word of God says that the commandments of the Lord are written in the conscience of everybody on the side of eternity. It says in verse 1, verse 18, it says, For the wrath of God has been revealed from heaven against the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. You see over there. It says, God has made it plain to them, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power, divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. So God says, God's going to speak to everybody regardless of what, who you are, where you are on the side of eternity. He was talking, talking to, in Romans chapter 2, um, in verse 14, it says, Indeed, when Gentiles do not have the law, who do not have the law, do by nature things required by the law. They are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. So these guys don't have the Bibles because they're Gentiles. Since they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bear them witnesses, and their thoughts now accusing them, now even defending them. Not accusing them, now even defending them. This will take place on the day when God will judge men's secrets through Jesus Christ, as my gospel declares. Can you see over there? Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 2, read it all together. Paul is letting us know that the fact that you guys don't have the Bible is no excuse for you to violate God's moral standards. You have God speaking to you in your conscience. You know what is wrong and what is right. And God's going to be telling you this is wrong, especially when you reach the age of accountability, which may be different for, for different people. But as you grow up, God is going to make known to you his requirements in your conscience. When you violate that, that becomes a sin of commission and you die because of it. And all of us have been guilty of that, me, myself inclusive. We were all born in ship and iniquity. We, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's why we've got to be born again in Jesus, Yahushua. So that's what a sin of commission is. But then God says, well, humanity is actually not, not, not catching up to my moral standard that I reveal to them in their consciences. So I'm going to help their minds to catch up with it a little bit. So I'm going to document for them through Moses, starting from Moses, document it until we have the Bible. And then he documented his moral standard for us in Exodus chapter 20. Let's take a look at it. What is this moral standard? That a violation will cause legitimate guilt in your heart. Exodus chapter 20. Let's take a look at it, which we call the Ten Commandments over there. A violation of any of those will result in a loss of right standing, whether you like it or not. <laughs> Glory to God. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 1. It says, For God and God spoke all these, these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt and out of the land, this land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of their fathers to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your sons or daughters, nor your manservant, or your maidservant, nor your animals, 
nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's property. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or his maidservant or his ox and donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When all the people saw these Saw, saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear. These are what we call the Ten Commandments, and Yahushua still further summarizes for us in the book of Matthew, because he's all about efficiency and keeping the Spirit behind the Word of God. And let's go over there to Matthew chapter 20, uh, chapter 22 rather. So if you can't remember all the Ten Commandments, Jesus breaks it down in just two for it. Yahushua says everything else in the Law and the Prophets are going to hang on these two over there. That is God's moral standard to you and to me. Let's look at it. Matthew chapter 22 and verse 34. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together, one of them an expert in the law, testing him with his question, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Yahushua replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your, your, all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So Jesus summarizes everything in Exodus chapter 20, everything actually from the book of Moses, from Genesis up into Deuteron Deuteronomy, and the rest of it we call the prophets. So everything from Genesis to Deuteronomy, you can call that the law, and the rest of it, including the book of Psalms, and all together, minor prophets, major prophets, you can call that prophets all together. Yahushua says the essence of their message is going to be founded in these two things over there, love God, love people. Hallelujah. A violation of loving God and loving people is going to inject legitimate guilt into your heart. Period. You bookmark it. That is a sin of commission. Oh, wow. Is that true? Correct. Look at the way it happened to Adam. So when God told Adam that you're not going to eat, you're not meant to be eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil back in the Garden of Eden, and he went ahead and he violated that command. You're going to ask yourself, is that love toward God? Of course not. It's not love toward God. So it's a violation of the Ten Commandments that God gave later down through Moses, several thousands of years later down through Moses. But God already said it in his heart, in his conscience. He knew, well, that's not right. I shouldn't rebel against the Lord my God. He violated and he died because of it. That's a sin of commission. And this generation doesn't even understand what sin is anymore. That's why we're breaking it down over here. you got to call it a sin. Refusing to love the Lord your God. Violating his instructions and his commandments to you. Rebelling against the Lord your God is a sin that will kill you. you got to repent of it right now by the grace of God in the name of Jesus. Repent so you can leave. But when you talk about I'm not dead yet and I'm still in sin. I'm not talking about physical death. I'm talking about a spiritual death. A spiritual death that is going to cause... Lack of peace in your heart. A spiritual death that's, uh, that's going to cause chaos in your circumstances. You're going to block your access to grace and mercy if you harbor treason in your heart. That's what we call treason. Sin of commission is treason. Repent of it in the name of Jesus. So SOC that's going to lead to legitimate guilt is going to come as a result of violating an, an, um, an explicit instruction of God's word or violating... An explicit instruction of God's moral standard that is still revealed to you in your conscience. You know it. It's God's moral standard. Why? Because God placed it in there. He's not just some kind of irresponsible creator who's going to send a human spirit into this planet without putting a little piece of his instructions, a little manual of his instruction into your conscience that can talk to you. 
Even though you heard the gospel of Jesus, you didn't hear the gospel of Jesus, that code of the Lord Almighty, your creator, is going to be talking to you. That's the reason if somebody were to die without necessarily hearing the gospel of Jesus, guess what? They're not going to go to hell automatically. Well, that's heresy. Well, you got to believe that truth because that truth is going to set you free from the pressure of wanting to go, go, go ye to the nations and preach to all the nations at the expense of thinking about discipleship. Oh, but that's not what, yeah, that's the truth. The word of God says in the book of 1 Peter that <laughs> God is going to preach to some people who died in the time of Noah. Uh, let me find that scripture for you. <laughs> Even though they didn't get a chance to be saved through the flood of Noah. Why will that happen? Because God is judging them based on their conscience. And that's what Paul is trying to say over there as well. God is trying to talk about it in, in, in the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 2, that God is going to judge the Gentiles based on how they responded to the law of God in their conscience. That's the reason God created a place that he called Abraham's bosom. And Abraham's bosom is still alive. Oh, well, I thought Abraham's bosom has been emptied. Uh, but, but that doesn't mean Abraham's bosom was decommissioned. When Yahushua came, he preached the spirits in prison. He took them all up to heaven. But we're told that Abraham's bosom is de decommissioned. You can't find that in the, in the word of God. That Abraham's bosom is decommissioned. I believe there is still a place over there. That when people die, if they die without hearing the gospel of Jesus, there is a temporary place where they are going to be given an opportunity to hear about the gospel of Yahushua based on their response to it. Based on their response, the response of their response to the law of God in their conscience is going to give them that privilege to go over there. And when they respond properly, then they can go to heaven. If they do not respond to it, then they're going to go to hell. There's still a place like that. Why am I talking about that? Because the law of God is written in your conscience. You've got to make sure that you nurture your response to that law of God in your conscience. It's fundamental, really important. Really important. Do not violate God's instruction to your conscience. God is telling you, love the Lord. You got to love the people in your world. Don't violate those instructions. Really, really important, fundamental. That is going to be a dead work if you violate it by the grace of God. I'm going to give you that, that assignment to go ahead and, <laughs> and look for it. It's going to be in uh, the book of uh, Peter, the Epistle of Peter over there. It says, God's patience waited during the time of Noah. And I don't have the time to search it out right now. When the patience of the Lord waited for the time of Noah. During the time of Noah. Go look at it. It says, God's going to preach to those people who died in the flood. Even though they, were, they didn't get saved with the, with, the, with the flood, with the ark of Noah. Why? Because of Romans 2. What we read in Romans 2 is going to be the reason for it. God's not just going to send people to hell just because they didn't hear the gospel of Jesus. And the unbelieving community and people in, of other religions that are not Christians, they knew that, and they know that intuitively. But our, our Christian brothers and sisters, they're going to bark their heads against it. And they say, well, no. They're going to say, well, except you be born again, you're not going to enter the kingdom of God. Correct. But that doesn't mean that just because they didn't hear the gospel of Jesus that God's going to throw them in hell automatically. Of course not. That's not going to be fair. Now, if you hear the gospel of Jesus and you refuse to do something with it, I believe you're going to go to hell. I believe that categorically. But if you die on the side of eternity without hearing the gospel of Jesus, but you have exercised your heart all the while in a good conscience, God is going to place you, put you in a place if you were to die. God's going to put you in a place temporarily for you to go back and hear that gospel over there. I believe there's going to be an angel over there. The Bible talks about the angel of death over there. He's not a demon of death. He's a servant of God. I believe there's going to be somebody over there who's going to preach to you. And then when you accept Jesus, you get born again over there, you can go to hell. Well, that doesn't mean God's going to send it to hell automatically even though you didn't hear the gospel of Jesus. Believe that categorically. Why is that information important? Well, for a number of reasons. Firstly, lots of our brothers that are getting themselves under pressure, well, I'm just going to stretch myself. I'm going to go ahead and preach to all those people in remote places all over the world. They haven't gotten a chance to hear the gospel of Jesus. I'm going to go jam it down their throat because I don't want them to go to hell. Well, if you understand this fundamentally, that pressure is going to leave, leave, leave you. 
is going to lift off right just like that. Because you understand that God is not an irresponsible creator. He's going to organize circumstances to get people to hear about the gospel of Jesus at the right time for them to respond to it. But don't you try to, to, to push yourself beyond your measure. We had, a, we had a, 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 one of our ORU kids and just went ahead and just, just lost his life, unfortunately, like that several years ago. Went into some remote island over there and said, well, I'm going to jam the gospel down their throat. They told him multiple times, this guy's a cannibal. They don't want to see anybody like that. And don't go over there. They snicked in over there. They shot him down. They killed him, unfortunately. Why? What's he run in the back of his mind? This philosophy. The philosophy that if you, if you die without hearing the gospel of Jesus, you're going to go to hell. No, I can say that categorically. If you die without hearing the gospel of Jesus, but if you exercise yourself in a good conscience, responding positively with the voice of God in your conscience, you are going to go into a place that we can call Abraham's bosom, and you are going to hear the gospel of Yahushua over there. If you respond positively with that gospel, you fly up to heaven. You're not going to go to hell. But if you weren't responding positive to the voice of God in your conscience, you do not have that privilege. That person, if they were to die in that condition, they are going to be bound and go to hell categorically. That is the complete gospel. And this generation needs to be told the truth because the path of the righteous is like the light that shines brighter and brighter unto the fullness of the day. Believe what I'm talking about to set you free from the bond of your incomplete knowledge about the gospel. Sin of commission. You gotta understand that. Adam's violation of an explicit instruction not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil resulted in the loss of right standing and immediate judgment. Eve's violation of an explicit instruction not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil uh, resulted in the loss of right standing but delayed judgment because of Adam's covering. The Word of God says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14, that Eve sinned first and became a sinner. And she thought, well, everything is okay with me. I mean, I didn't lose my glory code. And Adam was fooled by that delayed judgment, and he joined with her. Which is a really dumb thing for him to have done over there. Joined with her in that treason, and then the covering got stripped away, and both of them lost their glory coats right now. Delayed judgment after treason is a ploy of Satan to disconnect you from the error of your way that is going to lead to the chaos in your circumstances. Make sure you don't be like Eve or Adam in the Garden of Eden. Violation of God's moral standard revealed to one's conscience. You've got to overcome all of these by repentance. So that is sin of commission that's going to lead to legitimate guilt. The second category of sin of commission is going to be sin of commission that leads to illegitimate guilt, and this is going to come as a result of incomplete understanding. The conscience becomes wound, and because subsequent actions do not proceed from faith, this will lead to an SOC, which will result in illegitimate guilt, which will block your right standing in the recreated human spirit. You gotta overcome all of this through a complete knowledge and revelation knowledge. Know why God knows in all situations and repents of unbelief. Why am I talking like that? Let's look at Romans chapter 14. There's a lot that we can glean from Brother Paul. <laughs> and he wrote all this just intuitively. Not necessarily because he saw them in the book of Moses. He just knew intuitively this is right. That is somebody that is responding positively with the voice of God in his conscience. Thank you, Brother Paul. Romans chapter 14, let's take a look at it. In verse 23, it says, But the man who has doubts is condemned if he eats, because his eating is not from faith. And everything that does not come from faith is going to be seen right now. So you see over there, he said, the man who, who eats without faith, he's talking about somebody is going to eat me, somebody may eat me, and Paul says, well, it doesn't really matter because God's given us everything richly to enjoy. He can eat me and not be in sin. He can eat me and be in sin. It's going to be based on, are you doing it in faith? Or are you doing it in doubt? Well, if I'm doing it in doubt, the word of God says over there, that's not going to be in faith, that's going to be a sin, that is going to condemn me. Now, the word condemnation over there, 
I believe it should not be written as condemnation. The word condemnation over there should be translated as guilt. Why? Because the word of God says there is that therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Because the law, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. There is no condemnation for anybody. There is no declaring that somebody is unfit for use. The blood of Jesus can rectify all situations. You apply 1 John 1 and 9, Hebrews chapter 9 is going to wipe the guilt out of way, give guilt away out of way. But that does not mean that there is not going to be a disturbance of your right skin in relationship with God. That's what Paul is trying to drive home over there. There is going to be a disturbance of your right skin in relationship. There is going to be a disturbance of your, of your connection with God. If you sin illegitimately, what does that mean? It means I am doing something that is not technically a violation of God's moral standard, but I've just been taught wrong. So I gave an example last year, two years ago. For some of us who grew up back in the 80s and the early 90s, you're going to have people preaching over there, well, you cannot use perfume over there. Because if you spray perfume on your body, you're going to be in sin. And some people were taught all that. And we said, well, man, if I spray perfume my butt, I'm going to be seen over there. Well, they've taught you wrongly. And all of a sudden, if perfume were to be sprayed on your body right now, you're going to start feeling guilty because of that. Well, because you did that, ignorantly, in doubt. But then what about if you were taught the word of God, that God says himself in the book of Proverbs, that oil and perfume actually make the heart glad. You go back in the Old Testament, God likes something to smell real nice. He's going to tell him, put that incense over there so I can enjoy the smell of it. So he goes, well, there's really nothing wrong about perfume. I mean, if you use perfume for seductive reasons, it may be wrong. That's going to be a violation of God's moral standard because you're not going to be loving your neighbor. If you want to do that from that standpoint, that's what you're thinking. But that's not what I'm doing. I just want to enjoy something really nice because God likes something to smell really nice. And I'm a cre creature of God. I mean, I want something nice as well. If you do it without knowledge, you can spread perfume on your body and your right skin relationship is not going to be disturbed. Why? Because you know like God knows in that situation. That's why I'm calling this one a sin that is going to lead to illegitimate guilt. The guilt's going to be in your conscience. If you don't know, like God knows. Truth. And that is an SOC. It is an SOC sin of commission, even though the guilt as a consequence of it is illegitimate. How do you get rid of it? In repentance from dead works, no lie God knows and repent of that doubt and unbelief in the name of Jesus. So God opened my eyes. Why am I feeling guilty? I'm not doing anything that's morally wrong. What's the problem with me? God's going to say your knowledge is not complete over there. You're doing it in doubt. Now go over there and look at that scripture. Faith's going to jump in your heart because of it. Boom. You're going to go ahead and spray perfume on your body. And you're not going to feel, feel bad about it. But by the grace of God. You're going to go ahead and eat that meat. And you're not going to feel bad about it. You're going to go ahead and do whatever is necessary to advance the forces of the kingdom of God in your life. And not feel bad about it by the grace of God. That's the reason Yahushua can eat on the Sabbath, and he's not going to feel bad about it. Well, but I thought the, the, the Ten Commandments said we should desecrate the Sabbath. Correct. Eating on the Sabbath does not necessarily mean you're desecrating the Sabbath. He kept the spirit behind it. They need that energy so they can travel 20 miles where they're going to be going ahead and preach in that village. They're going to walk over here, walk over. There's no point. You're trying to go ahead and try to heal somebody on the Sabbath. And on your way to heal somebody, you, you faint at yourself because you're out of energy. Yahushua's going to tell his disciples, go over there and go eat something so you can get energy. Come on over. Come on over here, guys. The Pharisees are going to latch on to that because they're stuck in the letter. They're stuck in illegitimate guilt on this. Oh, we can't eat anything on the Sabbath even though we're going to die trying to journey over there to do good on the Sabbath. Can you see how this is working right now? But complete knowledge. Keeping the spirit behind the ladder is going to set you free. How do you know that? You cry out to God, open my eyes. And so see illegitimate guilt canceled by the grace of God. And now the scripture that talks about that, of course, is 1 John chapter 3. God says that there may be guilt in our hearts, even though God does not want guilt to be in there. 1 John chapter 3 and from verse 19. It says, this is how we know. That will belong to the truth. And how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. Whenever our hearts condemn us. 
For God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God, and we receive from him anything we ask because we obey his commands and do what is pleasing to them. Now, I've said it numerous times that John does not have the education of Paul. Paul was a lawyer, so he could document things really clearly, even though the things are documented. Some people are arresting, they're twisting to their own advantage or disadvantage. But, but John didn't have that education, so his writing style may not be as clear as what Paul might have written years ago. So what's the spirit behind this? The spirit behind this passage of scripture is you got to make sure that there is no condemnation in your heart if you want to receive anything from God. Now, the word translated condemnation over there, I believe, should not be translated condemnation at all. It should be guilt. And that is going to be correct. The Lord's not going to hear me if there is guilt in my heart. The, the, the word of God talks about in the book of Psalms. It says, uh, it says that iniquity, God is not going to hear you if there is iniquity in your heart. It talks about in the book of Psalms. You're going to see all of that through the Bible. If there is guilt in my heart because of a sin of commission, of course God can hear you because of that. That's what it's talking about. But in addition to that, the Spirit of the Lord is trying to get John to document over there that I can have guilt in my heart and God is greater than that guilt. In other words, as far as God is concerned, there shouldn't be that guilt in your heart to start with. That's why I'm calling this particular category of sins illegitimate. It means it's not legal. It's not legal guilt. What will make it illegitimate? What Romans chapter 14 verse 23 talked about. You're doing it in doubt. You're doing it outside the perimeters of faith. Like eating men, spraying perfume on your body, eating on the Sabbath if you need strength to do whatever you want to do or something like that. Not knowing like God knows is going to inject doubt in your heart, which will lead to illegitimate guilt. It's still an SOC, which will block your prayers. Get rid of it by knowing like God knows in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So that's the first category of sins. We talked about a uh, sin of commission. So let's go over right now the sins of omission. Sins of omission, S-O-M, do not lead to death or a loss of right standing relationship with God. It is simply an omission of implicit or suggested or implied instruction. But he may lead to death if God were to escalate your standard of righteousness and if the individual refuses to comply. And a good example to see how this, how this works is going to be the case of Adam and Eve. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve's negligence of the implicit instruction to be eating from the tree of life stated in the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 2 from verse 9 to verse 17. You guys are welcome to do that study later. You're going to see over there that God told them implicitly to be eating from the tree of life. Even though he didn't tell them categorically that thou must eat from the tree of life. Because if you were to tell them that and they don't do it, that's going to be a sin of commission. You see how this is working right now? So the father is just going to imply it. So God told Adam, well, guess what? There are two trees in the middle of the garden. And you may eat from any tree that's in the garden. But there's just one tree over there called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is placed side by side with the tree of life. Make sure you do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why did God call out the tree of life? Out of all the trees in the garden. He didn't tell them, Thou must eat from the tree of life. Go look at it in Genesis 2. But he implied it. But he's because he's a God of love. He knows eating from the tree of life. Drinking from the tree of life. is going to give you that wisdom. That strategy. That strength of an ox. So when the devil were to show up or something like that, you have the wisdom to outmaneuver. God implied all that. But God knew that, well, these creatures of mine, they're just going to be busy goofing around and they're going to be playing in the pond over there. And they're going to fly to this little creek over there in the Garden of Eden, just enjoying God's creation. And they can go days and days without eating from the tree of life. God said, well, that's okay. I mean, I'm not going to, going to, going to make my, your right stand relationship with me to be disturbed just because you want to enjoy the beauty of my creation. But there's an implicit instruction over here, guys. Come on, come on, eat it from that tree of life. But I can't tell you that categorically because if you were not to do it, <laughs> then you're going to die. Look at it. Think about it. 
And God did the same thing with Elijah back in the Old Testament. For some of you who have read that story before, in 1 Kings, God's going to tell Elijah after the conquest of uh, the prophets of Baal, Elijah got dysfunctional. He said, God, I'm going, I'm coming home right now. Let me look at all these jerks of them. They're trying to kill everybody. I'm the only one left over here. I mean, I've done your will forever since. And I, and I, no doubts about it. Elijah was definitely a stud. One of my favorite characters in the Bible. That, he pushed on some things. That boy really tried. He did a lot of work. I mean, right in that generation over there, worshiping idols, he, he still managed to keep his conscience clean and be treason-free for years. I mean, he did a lot of stuff. I mean, that's God-given ex exception. He snatched him up over there. But God is going to tell him, hey, Elijah, come and relax over here. No, 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 God, I've got a lot of things for you to do over there. Go sit on that old tree over there. God's going to place him under a tree and give him food over there. It's going to make him sleep off. He sleeps off and, and God's going to tell him, Elijah, what are you doing here? Say, I'm tired. Okay? I, I want to get over there. I'm going to say, go, go ahead and sleep a little bit. Go eat a little bit. Why didn't God tell him categorically, Elijah, you're going to stay here and carry on with ministry? Because God knew that Elijah was not inclined to do that anymore. And if he were to say, I'm not going to do that, that's going to be treason and that's going to kill him. With all the great words that he did for God, that law is going to send him to hell just because he, he, he violated it. So that's where the father thinks. So when he sees, especially if you walk with God significantly, God's going to start implying some things to you. Well, not on a command yet. No commands over here, but just implying it to you. That's how you know that there is a sin of omission over there. But later on, when God wanted to, even in that mode of dysfunction that Elijah was, God wanted him to go ahead and anoint Jehu and get Elisha over there. God told him, express, now stand up from there. Go ahead and anoint Jehu. Go ahead and do this. And when he realized that's a command, he said, yes, sir, I'm going to do that right now. <laughs> Elijah understood command. He got up and he went ahead and anointed Jehu, anointed Elisha. Why didn't he say, I don't want to do that? <laughs> he understands commands. Commands, a violation of commands is really critical. It's what I call treason. You do not, do, do not violate commands. God says yes, you're going to say yes, sir. When he says no, you're going to say no, sir. A violation of commands is treason. You don't do it. <laughs> you're going to go to hell. Except you repent quickly with the blood of Jesus and plan to repeat that test of passing and flying colors. But God understands lots of times some things are not too critical, so he is not going to offer those instructions as explicit instructions. Rather, he's going to offer them as implicit instructions. Just nod you a little bit and expect if you're going to be a thinking creature, not just a slipping creature, you're going to connect the dots over there and start to obey those implicit instructions so you can get energy from that obedience. That's what we call sins of omission. Glory to God. So study through the Bible, you're going to see that what I'm talking about is actually right. So there are two categories of sins I talked about today. There's the sin of commission, there's the sin of omission. Sin of commission is treason. Explicit instruction of God's word, you violated it, you rebel against God. No, no, we don't do that. Sins of omission are going to be implicit instructions. For example, if you're just born again, God's not going to be telling you categorically, categorically to start a function like a priest to the heavenly tabernacle. But God's going to be nudging you in that direction. You're going to see, well, your prayers are getting delayed right now. It seems like the answers are not coming like you expect the answers to come again. So what's going on? Well, God's nudging you over there. Go ahead and study some more. Not a sin of commission just yet. But as you grow up, then God's going to start connecting you with his ministry. They're going to start taking you through the meats of the word. They're going to start telling you, well, you got to make sure you start contributing your own quarter of the life of God that has been used all the while to pay your spiritual bills. And if you say, well, I'm not going to do that, then that's going to be a violation of a command right now. It becomes a sin of commission to you. You don't want to do that either. So we understand what dead works are. We understand what sins are. We understand what a sin, a sin of commission is. We understand what a sin of omission is. Let's all put it together right now. What is repentance? After one hour, we're still talking about repentance. I thought we talked about repentance. <laughs> well, we're just talking about dead works, different kinds of works that can lead to death. Some works that may not lead to death. Well, let's put it together so we can understand holistically what repentance from dead works is. What is repentance? Repent 
Exodus is going to be a turning of a human wheel from a direction of hostility to a direction of friendliness toward God. I got that definition from the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 21. Yahushua talking to the church in Thyatira and told that woman over there, repent of your sins, or I'm going to strike you down with a disease over there. That's Jesus talking. We got preachers in the 21st century that are trying to, trying to tell us that you don't need to repent anymore. Because Yahushua pay the price for your sins. is taking your sins away. His blood is just going to automatically wash away your trees. And you, don't, you don't even think about it. Just thank the Lord that the blood of Jesus is washing my sins away. How come Yahushua, Jesus, when you call Jesus, when he was raised from the dead over here in Revelation chapter 2, he is still telling this woman over there, repent or I'm going to deal with you. Look at it. Revelation chapter 2, in verse 20. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality. And eating of foods sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. Underline that. That's where we got the definition of repentance from. It's a change of the will. If she were to be willing, then she would have repented. So this repentance is a change of the will. But I've given her time to be willing. She doesn't want to be willing. I will deal with her. Look at what Jesus said over there. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children with death, and then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds, even at the heart level, the mind level. You can sin, sin of commission at the heart level. That's what Jesus said in the Gospels. Consistent with the story as well over there. As you get angry and over there, Jesus calls you a murderer. Do you look at another person lost? Well, Jesus calls you a fornicator and adulterer, even on the heart level. Jesus said, I'm searching those things on the heart level. You don't do it, I'm going to deal with you. That's what Jesus is talking about over there. And he's talking to a woman who is born again because she is preaching over there. And won't Jesus pay the price of her sins prior to the story? And yet Yahushua is telling her, repent. And he got some of our preachers in the 21st century telling us you don't need to repent anymore. Hogwash, don't tell me that crap. Nonsense. You hear somebody telling you that, turn up that channel and go, go do something else. Go play, go play poker with your, with your children or build Legos or something like that with them. It's going to be a better use of your time. Don't believe that. Repent. It's, a, it's, a, it's important. You got to repent. What is repentance? Repentance is a turning on the wheel from a direction of hostility to a direction of friendliness toward God. And when applied to a dead work, it's going to be called repentance from dead work. Because you can repent from things that are not dead works just yet. You can repent from milestone negative one, which is a carnal mind. You can repent from a carnal wheel. You can repent even from temptations. You can repent even from sins of commission. You don't have to wait until you, until you get to sins of commission to activate the principle of repentance and change that wheel, moving backward, upward, in the direction of godliness. That's the reason I call it turning from a direction of hostility. A carnal mind is a direction of hostility against God. A carnal will is a direction of hostility against God. Temptations will be direction of hostility. Those are milestones, which we are going to study a little bit later. But when you apply the principle of repentance to dead work, it becomes repentance from dead works or repentance from milestone negative four. Repent from it in the name of Jesus. Why do we need to repent? The Word of God says in the book of Acts that you got to repent so your sins can be forgiven so you can receive mercy. Proverbs chapter 28 says, He who covers his sins shall not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes shall obtain mercy. Acts chapter 2 and in verse 38 says, Repent and be baptized, all of you, for the forgiveness of your sins. And so, uh, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will, be, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit that promises for you and your children, and for all who are far off. 
There is no receiving forgiveness without repentance, even though the price for the forgiveness had been paid 2,000 years ago on the cross of Calvary. That's the truth of the word of God. Shield yourself from the influence of lying spirits telling you you don't repent. You don't need to repent anymore. Error. Cancel it out in the name of Jesus. You've got to change your will in the direction of godliness. Turn upward to the upward milestone. The word of God says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord's not going to hear me. In the book of Psalms, we just talked about that as well. That guilt is going to block your right standing. God can't hear you, even though you're shouting so loudly. There is that guilt over there. What's the feeling of guilt going to look like? Well, the feeling of guilt is going to look like what happened to Adam in the Garden of Eden. They're going to run away from the presence of the Lord. They're going to be afraid over there. They're going to want to go hide in those bushes. And that's what happens to you when you violate God's moral standards, whether you like it or not. And getting into, oh, well, I'm just going to thank God there's no guilt in my heart. I'm just going to go ahead and eat a pizza or something like that. He's not going to eliminate the guilt. <laughs> That's why we have lots of people afraid all around the planet. They're afraid all around the planet. They don't understand, why am I afraid? The reason you're afraid is because you, you, you got treason in your heart. You may be treason in your mind. You may be treason in your will. There's something in there. And Jesus is looking at that. So there's treason over there, right standing, blood. Treason over there, right standing. The law has been configured that way. And there's going to be that fear over there lurking in your heart. You're trying to do the fray. You can't do the fray. God can cast you out. Don't do that. Repent of it. When you repent of it, the righteous is going to be as bold as a lion. You're going to see even going through all these pandemics and things happening left, right, and say, there's a boldness coming out of you. Why? Because you're bold. You are as bold as a, as a, as a liar. Why? Because there's a boldness of the righteous over there. What's getting me there? Right standing relationship intact. So where water flowed into you, giving you the strength in your heart. There is no sin over there. Repentance is intact. No fears in there. If you harbor treason, there's going to be fear in your heart you can't receive from God. That's why you got to repent. Another reason we got to repent so we can obtain mercy. He who covers his sins shall not prosper. He who confesses the forsake shall obtain mercy. The word of God says over there. And how many people can act and operate without the mercy of God? We learned that in the pharmacy section of the word. The answer to that is a categorical no, nothing. I'm going to tell you what you can do without the mercy of the Lord. Absolutely nothing. By the mercy of the Lord, we're not consumed. To temper the demands of your negative judgment activated because of, of your sins, you need mercy. To neutralize the effect of your frailties, the sins of the carnal and the unbelieving around you, your pro progenitors, you need mercy. To help you to sustain the status of perfect obedience, organize the circumstances to make it easy for you to obey God and please God in the sight of eternity, you need mercy. And how do you get that mercy? Proverbs 28, 13. Repent. Especially in the category of sins of condition right now. He got called a spade a spade. This is a sin. I repent. I change my will. I turn from my past sins. I say goodbye to the law. I repent right now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So you can get times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. Acts chapter 3 verse 19 talked about that. There is no peace for the wicked. The word of God says somewhere. Lots of peace over there. Oh, I have peace in my heart. What's going on? Well, there may be treason somewhere. I'm losing my peace right now. Of course, there is no incense that's going to flow if there is no Zoe water. You got to get Zoe water fundamentally because there is right standing and water can flow into the womb of your spirit to give you Zoe spices. You can burn those spices so you can have peace in your mind right now. But you can have that time of refreshing from the presence of the Lord if you block your right standard relationship because you're harboring treason in your heart. No, we're not like that. Repent of treason. I turn from my past sins and I say goodbye and declare that I am a new man in Christ Jesus. I repent in the name of Yahushua. Repent. Glory to God. And so several reasons why you cannot play around with treason. The Father was right all the while. It will kill and I'm talking about kill. K-I-L-L -L, kill. <laughs> Go kill. So get, get rid of it. Dangerous. You treat like a rattlesnake. You're more dangerous than a rattlesnake. Violating God's instruction, the commands to you. So no, that's not my property to start with. I return that property to that loser devil who started that concept of treason against a good God. He deserves the worst of hell he can get for it. We talked about in the pharmacy section of the word. Sin, not my property. 
How do we repent? You got to repent to the baseline sin and get born again. Without that repentance, you want to carry on and be your own Lord, you're not going to get born again. Even though you came to the altar call and, and, and they gave you Kool-Aid afterwards. Repent of that sin first. They call you Hush. The creator of the ends of the earth sent somebody to come die for your sins 2,000 years ago. Call him Lord. Call him Jesus or call him Jesu or Yahushua, whatever. Just acknowledge that somebody came 2,000 years ago. I'm asking that person, please be my Lord, be my master. I submit to your guidance right now that you're going to be born again if you say that. Then subsequently, you're going to repent of all the sins, all the sins in your flesh, like fornication, adultery, lying, cheating, all the madness going in your mind. God's going to give you the strength right now to say no to them in your circumstances because your spirit got born again, but your mind didn't get born again, your will didn't get born again, your emotions didn't get you're born again, your body didn't get born again, and all those evils are going to try to come up even after you get born again because they are still in your flesh. But you've got to deal with them with the strength of an ox that is in your spirit right now when God convicts you through the God's first move and man's move and God's final move which we are going to delve deeper into next week in the part two of this message by the grace of God but we broached the topic today by talking about the concept of repentance from dead works and I'm hoping you got something from it by the grace of God hallelujah glory to God did you get something from it repentance from dead works part one is what we talked about today we understand the concept of dead work, dead works, what dead works are, what kind of works are going to be called dead works, sins of, sins of commission. What kind of works are not going to be called dead works, sins of commission. On the sins of commission category, there are two types of dead works, sins of commission that produces legitimate guilt, sin of commission that does not produce legitimate guilt. We we'll talked about all of that by the grace of God. And why are we trying to classify the ODP into all those different categories of the milk of the word, or the water of the words? Because you are a temple of the Holy Spirit and different aspects of the word of God need to be exposed. You need to be exposed to those different aspects of the word of God. So you can be a functional temple, carriers of the glory of the word. Something's going to fix your soil for you, fix your foundation for you, fix your roof and your structure for you. By the grace of God, as you build your operation. As glory carriers, even in the season of darkness, because we need you for it. The Father needs you to do that. Going through downtown anywhere you are. The temple of the Lord is moving over there, going over there. God wants your glory, to, the glory of the Lord, to be a mobile temple everywhere you're going. That's what you are. That's who you are. That's who I am. By the grace of God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Did you get something out of it? I believe you did. Uh, by the grace of God, I'm, and as my custom is, I'm going to give the viewing audience an opportunity to take a snapshot of the study notes on the board so they can study along with us. And I'll be back after 10 seconds. Oh, praise the name of Jesus. Did you get something out of it? You got a chance to take a copy of the study notes on the board? I believe you did. Thank you so much for joining us today. That's going to be Repentance from Dead Works Part 1. Please make sure you come back for Part 2 next week. The milk section of the Word of God in ODP 2021 online discipleship program from Hero Smart. I want to thank you for joining us. Let's say be blessed in the name of Yahushua. Amen.